Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My name is Peter Schrappen with Northwest Marine Trade Association. I get the distinct pleasure of being the co-host for tonight's festivities, episode 25 of Seattle Boat Show Live. And I see Mark Bunzel in my other Zoom window right there. Hi, Mark. Good evening, sir. Hey, Peter. You know, that opening just reminds me of what the warm weather actually feels like. You know, you see people running around in bathing suits and actually jumping into the water. Uh, these days, from my boat, I see white caps. Yeah, it was ancient history at this point. We've got a, a week of weather ahead of us. I don't know if you've looked at the uh, weather report, but there is some scary stuff on the horizon, be it wind yeah. and snow and rain. I, I hear pestilence is on its way as well. Yes. Par for the course of 2020. But yeah, we've got a big show planned tonight. What's on tap? Well, we're this is going to be a lot of fun. We have uh, uh, somebody that Leonard Lorena and I uh, actually got to visit. Uh, last spring when it was much warmer. Uh, Mark LeBlanc, uh, the regional director for the West Coast for Canadian Hydrographic Services. And he's got a lot of information about us. And these people just do a fabulous job. I've always admired the cartography they do and the, the beautiful maps that they do as well as all the other information. And so Mark's gonna come on in about 15 minutes and give us uh, uh, a lot of information about things that are changing in uh, CHS. Uh, and uh, hopefully we're gonna get a chance to next summer to uh, actually utilize that information in British Columbia. So uh, we're all big keeping show. our fingers crossed on that yeah. one. Yeah, big show. I wore a dress shirt, I brushed my teeth, Mark. I'm ready to roll. You did, well, you know, you're our government affairs person. And so we're, we're treating you to another government affairs person. Excellent. Well, that we can speak the same language there. I had a few things happen to me this week, Mark, along that government affairs route, if you would indulge me. Please. I, you always have interesting information. Go yeah, for it. Thanks. So uh, you may remember the Be Whale Wise uh, guidelines around yes. the buffer zone, and I'll put those in the chat box. But now as Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is thinking about future rules around whale watching, <laughs> They're taking a little direct, different direction than I think what we were anticipating. So right now, they want to look as, at the Professional Whale Watching Association, not as sentinels, not as like professionals, guideposts that are actually doing the community a favor by doing the right thing, but rather as more of an obstacle. And so that's a tough one. Um, so if you either see them as sentinels or not, that's going to really inform your point of view. And uh, we've seen them as professionals using best practices out there, yes. being helping recreational boaters out there as to where the boats, where the whales are and not infringing on the whale, uh, the whale room. Uh, so that's, we're going to see how WDFW comes down that, but the Recreational Boating Association of Washington and NMTA fired off a letter today, Mark, we got it in uh, before the cutoff on comments. So we'll see how that, that one plays out. That's obviously we're all pro whale, but we're also not pro closing off access to boating. So we shall see, right. and that's going to come down to the the, the commission. The, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission will be the arbiters on that one. Um, mm. Another issue, another issue I'm working on is Andrews Bay, the over only overnight moorage available to Lake Washington for the most part. So uh, Doug Levy of Arbaugh and myself had a Zoom meeting with City Councilor Tammy Morales last Sunday to talk about how we don't represent the drunk boaters. We're representing the responsible boaters, uh, but we don't want to ban boating in Andrews Bay. She wasn't as familiar with us as um, we had hoped. So we were able to educate her on the NMTA Arbaugh history, how we're, we have advocated for strong boating under the influence legislation. But again, we have some core values. We don't like to see bans. So we're trying to figure out a buoy system, a permitting system and see if we can find a happy meeting that makes the neighbors more comfortable with having boats that have some noise uh, as, long, as long as they're acting um, in a good manner. So again, another one that we're doing some advocacy for on behalf of boaters, but a, a real special area. Have you spent much time in that area, Mark? Uh, a little bit. I visited a couple times, but I've heard about it from uh, one of my friends who was with the uh, Seattle Harbor Police and uh, also a neighbor who lives on Mercer Island who who said uh, last summer things things got a little uh, a little more active than they had in the past. Yeah, a little bit of tomfoolery going on in those parts. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that one plays out. Uh, we, had some, we had a big election since, uh, we, well, I guess we were here last Thursday, but some of the results were still trickling in. But it looks like a lot of stability in Washington State. I think I said that last week as well. But as the results came in, not a lot of change in the makeup of the House or the Senate. The Democrats will have some nice margins there um, if you're a Democrat. 
They'll continue that, that control of the uh, chambers. The House Democrats have kept that control mark since 2001. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Really unprecedented. I, I was glad to hear about Hillary Franz coming, uh, being voted back in. And uh, Peter, we need to have her on a Thursday night segment with us. Yeah, she's a hoot. Uh, she is unfiltered, and uh, you never know what she's going to say. It makes for a now lot of fun. That'll be the fun with it. And and uh, but uh, people are concerned of how. And I think when they hear a government official talking about this, that she's the steward of our land and our water land. I think they'll have a, a, a sense of appreciation for the oh, I, Department of Natural Resources. I think you're right. She talks like a normal person. You're kind of on the edge of your seat as a host. You don't know if the FEC is going to slap a warning on our show, but that's comes with the territory, Mark. That's okay. That's good. It makes the, for good good TV. That's right. Must see TV. That's what we like to say around here. Um, right. uh, another. Uh, oh, actually, I, I would highlight we, uh, there's a recreational fishing foe out of the Ilwaco area that lost. So it's very rare for incumbents to lose. Incumbents win about 90% of their time. Um, and the, the, if you know that area, that's a Republican-y turning area where they were electing those blue dog Democrats. Well, that, that time is over. They elected a state senator, uh, Republican for the first time in forever. And then uh, Representative Brian Blake lost his seat. He'd been there since 02 wow. and not so friendly on recreational fishing issues. So. Um, if you uh, believe in recreational fishing like we do, we were um, excited to see the, uh, let's just say the new face that will be on board. Um, so yeah, that session starts January 11th. They've issued their guidelines, Mark, around what the legislature, how they're gonna be going about it. I'm gonna guess, you know, the, the word of the year is Zoom. A lot of Zooming going on next year, The especially on the House side, there will not be a lot of activity. Everything at the campus will be closed. So there will be um, a lot of Zoom 15 minute meetings through the, the 105 day session, the long session. And then before, I'll stop babbling after this, Mark, but I wanted to say, uh, make sure everyone knew about the Seattle Boat Show Connected. We touched upon this last week. That's the yes. future of the Seattle Boat Show. You are attending a webinar today. I saw your your mug on that. I was there as well there. for a little bit. And uh, we are gung-ho excited about what Seattle Boat Show Connected is going to look like. It's uh, The Seattle Boat Show has been part of uh, the culture of, of Seattle, the Puget Sound boaters. And I mean, when we got started back in, I guess it was 45, who would have guessed that the Seattle Boat Show would be going at, something called online staring at a box and doing that show but that's exactly what we're going to do and the show is going to run january 28th through january 31st it's a thursday through sunday we're going to sell tickets starting on december 15th and you're going to be hard pressed not to see a commercial billboard digital ad supporting boating throughout the course of january so i'll be uh lucky you mark i'll be hosting about 34 hours of entertainment yeah uh, having guests coming and going podcast style uh kind of uh to today's show yeah uh, yeah 80 different guests um we've got chef ethan stoll who will be a guest of mine huh, landon's you're you're ready for me to stop talking aren't you uh we'll have the landon's uh that's my cue um no we'll we'll have the um ethan stoll uh on talking about shrimping uh and how to cook shrimp salmon and crab and then we'll also be looking at uh, doing a house tour of liveaboards and houseboats and yeah it's going to be a good time so uh more to come on that i think we should do a show on that mark don't you think yeah, we're, we're starting to sketch that out because it is going to be different, uh, but tons of information. And uh, we're gearing up with Seattle Boat Show University and, and uh, a lot of seminars. And, uh, but uh, companies like ours at the Wagner Guide, we're going to have our own booth and we'll be there for information. We're looking forward to talking to our customers as we do during a live boat show but now we're going to do it through uh, through Zoom. Exactly. So, uh, cool. Some of that will be more personalized than we've been able to do at the boat show. So that'll and be we, interesting. It'll be a lot of fun. We can open up the show to the entire world, which we sell tickets to 41 states and 16 provinces typically. But this year we can have visitors from all over the world. And I actually anticipate having some guests from around the world talk about boating in Australia and New Zealand and Spain and yeah, more to come. I, I see Michael Benders is saying hi from San Francisco. It's chilly 65 degrees, uh, but 10... 10 knots out there, uh, out of the gate. So that's great. If anybody else wants to say hi, jump in that chat. Don't be a stranger. Feel free just to say hi, where you're coming, where you're uh, sitting down, taking us in, as well as any questions. And uh, Mark, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thank you. I was wondering. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding you. You know. <laughs> I'm well, out of here. <laughs> this is the time of the show where we go through some updates. And we actually have some updates this week. Critical if you do decide to go out boating, and I'll turn it over to Leonard and Lorena. 
Where do we have some? We always have updates here. You do. You do. (laughs) That's the update for you. (laughs) But this 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 week you've got a couple of critical ones. Oh, we did, right. Are you referring to the deadline for the Wagoner guide? (laughs) No, that one's over. We're we're done. (laughs) And we got the bell. Okay. There's eleven minutes, eleven minutes before we got a wagoner out of your mouth. Good job, guys. A new record. (laughs) I'm talking about uh, the Des Moines Marina. Oh, yes. we got that coming up. Yeah, the Des Moines Marina, uh, if you're headed to South Sound to do some cruising, the entrance to the marina will be closed to all vessels. They are doing some dredging, important dredging that uh, needs to be done right away, and that will begin November 16th, and it will probably take up to a week, so uh, put that on your calendar. Um, they'll have that done in about a week after they start November 16th. So that inexpensive fuel is not going to be available for a week. Right. And that's important information. That's what Des Moines means, inexpensive fuel. Did you know that? That's right. In, tongue. <laughs> in, in a certain tribal dialect. And then uh, Capistani Marina, which is part of the port of Anacortes, they reported that they doubled their guest moorage stays in October. And likewise, their shoulder season stays were also up in September. Of course, boaters haven't been able to go across the border. So they're spending time in the islands of Skagit County and San Juan County. Uh, The downside is um, the fuel sales were down by 27%. Of course, boaters haven't been uh, going or venturing out as far, but uh, we welcome certainly the cruising in Anacortes and, and uh, our own waters here. That's been great. The, did you have some of uh, the COVID numbers? Uh, COVID, uh, unfortunately, they continue to go up. Uh, BC had 1,100 new cases just in the last couple of days. And of course, Washington State is going up as well. So the total cases uh, in BC over 19,000 and Washington State, 130,000. Uh, just a reminder, we need to be vigilant and continue our good practices. And uh, yeah. we're, we're, reserved. Reserved. I was gonna say, we're reservedly optimistic for next, uh, for next season. Uh, and the optimism shows through when I got my notice for uh, to renew the Customs and Border Protection decal for next year. And I went ahead and did that. So uh, I'm confident that I'm going to be able to get to use that decal. Uh, Money that's back the guarantee. Option. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I was going to mention Governor Inslee had a press conference today at 530. And for those who didn't uh, get a chance to see it, we were worried that there'd be more restrictions. Um, I guess worried is the wrong word. We were thinking there might be more restrictions. In fact, though, he was just encouraging people not to gather over Thanksgiving. And he said anticipate more restrictions, though, in the near future. So he showed his hand a little bit there. Uh, and then in the chat, we've got Anton, Anton saying hi, uh, as well as Rick, Richard Swanson. Um, Thatcher Harvey sitting in LeConnor. Glad uh, he's not out on the water. Richard Townsend uh, are in Coronado, California. Very nice. We've got my mom in St. Louis saying hi to all of us. That's great. Hi, mom. Uh, and another couple of boaters in San Francisco. So hello, everybody. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Richard Swanson uh, says hello. And uh, he was, uh, Dick was part of my trip to Alaska in 2019. And he's tuning in from Philadelphia, so uh, we're we're getting out there, aren't we? Are you paying these people, Mark, to watch us? I I, I do. I, I send <laughs> bottles of wine. The further away they are, we also okay. have some notice to mariners that we can uh, talk so, about here. Yeah, one of them. Uh, I wanted to do a share screen on here. There's a um, uh, comes up here. Oops, and. Uh, do. It's dark there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Joke never gets old. So there's a, is that up the slide? Yeah, you look there? great. You're coming in. So great. There is a, uh, this is then the local notice to Mariners just came out and there's a temporary restriction, a restricted area with no entry that's coming up next week. So it starts 16th through the 20th. It's near Port Townsend. Zooming in a little bit more here. Uh, it's off of Indian Island, just on the west side of Indian Island. Uh, and you have to stay about 500 yards away from all vessels. And we'll zoom in a little one more time on this. And again, Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday next week, and 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. No entry. 
uh, they're doing some simulated uh, res uh, attacks basically on the facility there. And there's gonna be some uh, gunboats over there. It sounds kind of actually, kind of sounds kind of interesting. I, I uh, was but, wondering if we should get front row seats. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was thinking about right, right over here on Irondale, if you just kind of over there where the Irondale dock is, uh, but th apparently they're gonna use gunboats and they have in the notice to Mariners, it says that they're gonna be using uh, firing blank uh, cartridges or blank uh, blanks basically, as they do a simulated uh, resistance against uh, attackers basically. So sounded like a very interesting thing uh, but that's coming up next week so stay out of that area uh if, if you happen to be in that area and again that's uh wait one second here i'll stop share that's uh coming up next week uh the other local i was gonna Mar jump in here real quick um this is a tough one as well because you think about all the restrictions going on to marine improvements um on the one hand that coming out of nymphs and NOAA, where we're just trying to improve facilities and then on the other hand you see these sorts of green lights it really is uh i'll say confusing for me, I, I get confused easily, as Mark could tell you. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting that um, Noah and Nymphs have gone that route. I'll put a little story in the chat that uh, we've been that kind of backs up my point there. Back to you, Laurent Leonard. Um, I was just going to add to that that the uh, the other no local notice to Mariners was that the uh, Noah is uh, is no longer in the business of printing tide and current tables. And uh, if you have a twenty twenty. Hold on to it because you that's the last one you're going to see in paper printed by NOAA. There are other sources, obviously, for this for ties and currents, but the last one from NOAA. Well, that's and, been a long time coming. They've been talking about that for a while, but I guess that's finally here, eh? Yeah. yeah and a little later on, Mark LeBlanc is going to tell us about some of the situations where certain uh, publications on the Canadian side are being uh, eliminated, also, or at least not going to be printed with ink on paper. They'll, they'll be available electronically and we'll hear more about that. But Leonard, I'm really curious about this point that you have. You're gonna talk about uh, the US Coast Guard change in carriage requirements. Oh, that was, uh, that was uh, one of the reasons that they cited uh, no longer printing that. So they apparently the US Coast Guard, it was carefully worded. It said that the US Cor Coast Guard has reinterpreted the carriage requirements for uh, printed uh, tide and current tables for, I assume, for commercial vessels. Uh, but uh, the key word to me was that they reinterpreted that, uh, which sounds kind of interesting. There, Did there they share with story. us their new interpretation? I don't know. <laughs> Can we ask them to yeah, reinterpret a few other things? But, uh, and I don't mean that disparagingly. The Coast Guard does a great job. So. I did have one more uh, item I wanted to talk about a little bit. We had uh, and, and of course, get ready with your bell over there, Peter. Uh, the uh, <laughs> the uh, Wagoner Guide, we're, we recognize we're, we're members of the Fidalgo Yacht Club here. And uh, the yacht clubs all over are struggling right now to make sure that they keep their groups together. Uh, and one of the, obviously one of the big things is Zoom calls and having a topic for Zoom calls. So we've put together about a half hour presentation that it is Wagoner Guide centric. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's about the Wagoner Guide and uh, what's coming up in the 2021 Wagoner Guide. But also it's a little bit about the changing mission of the Wagoner Guide and uh, not just the printed book, but also the Wagoner and the brand and, and all of us. The, it includes the webinar and everything. We have a, a growing community of voters out here and uh, as illustrated by the closure of the, of the border, uh, when, when we have to be in one particular area, there are really, we need more places to go. We need more destinations. We need to make sure they're accessible to us and we're doing things that aren't environmentally wrong. And uh, there's a place for the Wagoner for that uh, and NMTA as well, but there's a big place for that. And there's a need for that right now. Uh, the mission changed about 30 years ago, the Wagoner Guide or 25 years ago, the Wagoner Guide was all about uh, helping people figure out where they were and how what the waters were. And, and a lot of that problem has been solved with uh, GPS and chart plotters and a no number of other resources. Uh, but the changing picture now is to make sure that we have all the resources out there for the, the increasing number of boaters that out there, are out there. Specifically, one of the things we're, we're looking at are ways that we can uh, make the, the anchorages and the destinations, uh, the marine parks, and make some of those places more accessible and accessible to more boats, but still keep the character of the boating that we all love out there right now. So that's part of our changing mission, and we're gonna share that. And again, back to our presentation, 
Uh, we have a half hour or so, and we're more than happy to do that on a Zoom call. Go out to wagonerguide.com, look at uh, forward slash contact, and uh, there's contact information. Send us an email, uh, give us a call, and we'd be happy to arrange a Zoom call. Thanks there, Leonard. Nice work. That was about 25 mentions of the Wagner Guide in two minutes. So every time you mention it, Angel gets its wings. So congratulations. Yeah, um, put a quarter in the jar. And, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Mark, speaking of destinations, what can you tell me about Lake Bay Marina? I feel like I need a drum roll here. Yeah. Uh, so many of you have been watching our show know that we have been uh, promoting the Lake Bay Marina and uh, uh, Arbaugh Regional Boating, uh, Recreational Boating Association of Washington had put together a program to actually purchase Lake Bay. We had an evening one night and promoted raising some money. We did, we were able to help with that. And then uh, when we came up close to the deadline, the end of September, the deal fell through completely with a big thud. And uh, uh, we were uh, ha having challenges making the deadline, wanted a, an extension and the owner of the property came back, and this is not new news, this was covered in a number of press releases, but actually uh, changed the pricing scenario and uh, the price went up by uh, quite a bit and uh, uh, the deal was dead. Well, we got word from uh, Bob Wise from Arbaugh uh, this week that the deal is back on. They, uh, uh, Bob persevered and was able to neg negotiate with the seller and uh, he did get a one-year extension on this, and we still have money to raise. Uh, but uh, uh, significantly to that, uh, several state agencies, uh, DNR, uh, RCO, have uh, uh, funding that is available to put towards this uh, with an application. And ARBA has gone ahead and done that. And uh, we're getting uh, optimistic that this is now going to happen. So. Those of you who donated money, I mentioned a week ago on our show that if you wanted your money back, uh, we would uh, return, uh, Arbaugh would return your money. Uh, Arbaugh though is also doing other projects uh, that are going to op up, open up mooring and uh, other possibilities. But now the Lake Bay project is back on and it looks like the sale is going to go through. It's under contract right now. And uh, 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 if you had donated money for this, it's gonna go for that. And we'll have more details of the new plans for that. We'll probably have Bob join us to, get, to give us more of the good news. So Lake Bay, uh, thank you if you have donated money. And some of you did ask for your money back and your money was, was returned. And uh, just in case you still wanna donate to the Lake Bay, uh, Arba will be more than happy to take your donation back and give you a tax deductible receipt for that. So uh, that's what's happening with Lake Bay. Uh, on the chat line though, and I'm excited about this, Ross McLean, thank you very much. He, he's giving us a, a bit of information which we didn't have. He's uh, tonight in North Saanich. And uh, 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 he's uh, reminding us that part of the Sydney spit area will be closed to the public. And uh, uh, starting November 1st through February 28th, so pretty much through the winter. And this is while members of the Coast Salish First Nation stage their annual fallow deer hunt. Now there's a tidbit, they're hunting deer on Sydney spit, which is one of my favorite boating destinations. And uh, I have seen a few deer there, but boy, I didn't know they actually opened up a, a hunting season there. I'll have to visit that someday. So the closure will uh, take in the area south of Sydney Spit, the day use area, which will remain open as will the mooring boys. So uh, uh, that's the uh, plan for the Sydney Spit and park closure uh, between November 1st and uh, right now and through uh, the beginning of 2021. So love it. Uh, good to know on that. Uh, yeah. us Americans, we can't go there anyway, but uh, our Canadian friends, uh, Sydney Spit is a favorite. So, uh, and I've got one other thing. No, I, I, th I think that covered it. We got Mike Lockatell saying hi. Mike's an old friend. It's great that Mike's tuning in tonight. And then uh, Michael Bender here, he's got an email that tonight was going to be on how our Canadian charge produce. Is this going to happen? Please let me know. That is a great question. I guess that's a, is that Michael, our cue? Michael, that's our segue. I love it. 
Yeah. That's and, also a fancy words for saying perfect. stop talking. Yeah, that is. That is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yes, we are going to talk about Canadian charts and I'm going to introduce our, our guest tonight. Uh, somebody Leonard Lorena and I got to know along with Kevin Monaghan uh, from China Sea, who used to be in Transport Canada. And uh, joining us is Mark LeBlanc. And uh, just popped up on the screen. And Mark is the regional director for the uh, Pacific for the Canadian Hydrographic Service. So he is the one responsible. He gets the blame as well as the credit <laughs> for all these great charts. And I, and I personally have enjoyed the Canadian charts. Uh, now, granted, I'm talking about the, uh, the raster charts, how, how colorful they are, uh, the great and clear cartography. I think Mark is probably gonna tell me, well, save those pleasant raster charts because that could be the end of them. But anyway, I'll, uh, Mark is gonna talk to us about what's going on north of the border and tease us just for those days that we can't wait for that border to open. So uh, Mark, thank you for coming. We appreciate you traveling all the way from your den to us electronically and giving up uh, your Thursday night. You're probably missing a good hockey game tonight, aren't you? Well, actually, the hockey season's not going to start until January 1st. So okay. uh, no NHL, but as you know, Seattle will be in that league very soon. So yes. there'll be some great rivalries there, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'll be curious. I haven't seen the schedule yet of when the Kraken is going to be playing the Canucks. <laughs> that will be fun. It absolutely will. So uh, it, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, with everyone tonight and see such great participation. Uh, I'll queue up a presentation here in a little bit and do a little bit of, of history and what CHS is like today and what tomorrow will be for you. And uh, I'll go through the presentation and uh, hope um, participants can uh, put their questions in the chat. And once I finish the presentation, I'll simply go over to the chat and I'll run down the questions and see if I can answer answer them. And you can ask me pretty much anything. Nothing's off bounds. And, oh. uh, if it's something I can't answer, I will let you know, but I'll give you at, at least what I think uh, uh, I may know on that topic. So. So I'm going to queue up that presentation now. And I see Peter's ready for some interesting questions. So I got it. <laughs> Okay, Voting related or go. not? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 while that's queuing up, I'll just fill the air for a little bit that, you know, uh, it's not voting related, but if you could explain what it means with the Liberal Party in Canada versus the Conservative, because I've been told it's backwards to the way we think. But anyway, no, don't go there. That would be an entire show. And we want to talk fun stuff with CHS. So go for it. Tell us about it. All right, wonderful. And it is, it is funny, Mark, that the federal liberals are very different from the British Columbia liberals. So the equation is not as, as, as clear as it is in Canada. But general, if you did a, a very macro comparison, the liberals would be Democrats and the conservatives would be Republicans. So you somewhat go with that and you, you probably got it. Uh, there. However, well, the liberals so. like to spend on marine initiatives. So uh, Good to know. very Good complicated. To know. So I'm going to queue this uh, presentation up and I'll run through. And like I said, once it's done, we'll uh, uh, look at any questions in the chat. I just love to hear from everyone. And, uh, you know, it's so tough these days to be able to uh, have an outreach program to mariners and boaters. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, this evening. I'm coming from e, uh, to you from East Soup tonight. So just right across the Strait of Juan de Fuca, I just walk up on the hill and I see, I can see right to Port Townsend uh, from uh, the area that I live. So uh, I am close by. So obviously things going on in the USA are uh, really important to us up here. Uh, so I'll start the presentation. You can see there, there's a survey crew at about 1900. And there's what a crew looks like these days. So you see things have changed a bit, but uh, we still in survey do silly things. We tend to point at land a lot and makes a lot of people nervous until you get used to it. So um, you can see the differences there. So you look at the activities, what CHS does. We do a collection of data. Of course, bathymetry is the important one. Tides and current data from our uh, permanent network of water level gauges and uh, tide meters. 
We do third party data through contracts, memorandums of understanding, like we share data with NOAA and NOAA shares data with us. And of course, uh, we have the Navajo Waters Protection Act. That's a big part of what we do. We manage that data and uh, Mark, uh, Lorena and Leonard have been in our, what we call our data warehouse and holdings and got a little, uh, little opportunity to look around and see what we have in there. And then of course, it's the production. We do the navigational charts, the paper raster vector formats, the tide and current tables, what we call dynamic products, which is where you'll be able to get real time data, which is gonna come along soon our sailing directions. And of course we do a license of data for non-navigation uses. So support industry, support academia. And we kind of look at our work as four pillars. You may not know it, but Canadian Hydrographic Service, we're responsible for the sovereignty borders of Canada. So we maintain our sets of international borders, our three and 12 mile limits, and then the kind of murkier economic zones that each country has and where those uh, end. Uh, we have great relationships with the U.S. though, so uh, uh, have lots of, uh, lots of agreements, still a few places where there's still some uh, discrepancies, but uh, we agree to disagree in some of those areas. And of course, the ocean and freshwater mapping. Uh, just like NOAA, we do all the major freshwater lakes in Canada, uh, so if you get a chance to go up on the Shishwap or uh, Lake Okanagan, you can have a CHS product to support your uh, boating up there. So we'd like to say why are charts necessary? And of course, we see in spite of charting, we still have accidents. And you look at some of these, it's not recreational boaters as well. Here's a, you know, this, uh, this deep sea found this rock quite handily, even though it's charted, it's still uh, managed to get up on this rock. And it's always fascinating to find the reasons why. Uh, again, you can really take a great looking vessel and put it in a bad spot. And it's amazing though, the tide comes up, you can usually get out of these situations. And of course, some, some major incidents of search and rescue craft in Sioux Harbor going very, very uh, high rated knots, about 20, 25 knots. And you can see the results here. And of course, uh, even with commercial, the Nathan E. Stewart, it, it was interesting, this accident, we had just put out a new edition of the chart. However, uh, the watchkeeper fell asleep. So. These are a lot of the situations in terms of, of boating, either on the commercial side, but how do we better make it safe? It's not just the chart. What can you do about watch keepers falling asleep? Uh, what are these other dynamics that can make navigation safer? And that's what's a lot of the things that CHS and NOAA look at now, or what are those extra products that are needed? So the historical overview, the Canadian Hydrographic Service actually started uh, in the Great Lakes, and it was the Georgia Bay Survey, and it was following the sinking of the SS Asia, and there was well over 180 lives lost, and our first survey was actually in the Great Lakes. A lot of other survey was done by the United Kingdom and the Admiralty uh, uh, branch, so a lot of Navy uh, vessels. There was always a naval presence in Esquimalt on this coast, and the Admiralty did a lot of our survey. Um, one of the things it's fun to see as you go around, if you look in the bottom uh, left corner, if you're on shore, look for one of our, our survey benchmarks. It's always neat to find one and get a photo. And I always like getting a photo if somebody finds one and say, hey, we found, because sometimes we lose track of where they are. So it's always neat to get those. Well, when you uh, anchor and row ashore and look around, chances are if it's a prominent cove, you'll find one of those little markers there. So. It's a little uh, uh, kind of like a, a, a geocache, but a lot of fun to find those and see them. We really started in, in, in the Pacific coast around 1907. There was a regional office in Victoria. And in 1928 is when we came the Canadian Hydrographic Service. So we, the office was located down on Government Street on Victoria to about 1978 when we moved to our present location up at the Institute of Ocean Sciences. Here's a look away it used to be surveys, a lot of lead line surveys. So that's why you see a lot of the soundings are in ni these nice straight lines. There was a triangulation done uh, shore based and then simply the vessel, the boat was moved along, drop the hand lead line and uh, get your uh, depth. And there was always a tide gauge to a little correction there. So for many years, that's the way surveys were done. Uh, surprise now, it's a very accurate way to get a, a depth is dropping down the hand lead line, hitting the bottom and taking that uh, 
that measurement. There's some of our original vessels. What fascinates me with the, the older vessels is how easy it was to construct these vessels. So built in Esquimalt, 1908, generally took about six to eight months to build a vessel like this and get it out. And uh, these were kind of the, the mother ships, so to speak, uh, used for surveys. And uh, this was with the Department of Naval Service. Uh, and this was the Little Loot. So this was kind of one of the first ships that uh, was built and dedicated for survey on the coast. Then for many years, the William J. Stewart. Uh, I believe this vessel still can be seen in Banfield on uh, the west coast of the island as a restaurant. So for the history buffs, you can actually go out and find the Stewart. One of its more dubious uh, historical events was striking Ripple Rock in Discovery Passage. So while on a survey, they found the rock all right, and uh, they put the vessel up on the rock, and when the tides come in, they were able to get off that. So. Uh, always an interesting uh, 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 piece of history. And you can see the other photo, the steward is alongside in Pat Bay and you see our little survey launches there, which is quite neat alongside and how they re uh, replace the uh, uh, former vessels that were smaller, more or less a dory for hand lead line work. And here in about the 60s and 70s, this is kind of what one of those vessels looked like. So. It was single beam uh, echo sounders. So you can see the equipment there and the typical uh, setup. And that was used to get these lines again. It was more automated, obviously, in the head lead lines. And then field sheets would be created from that data. Uh, basically, you, you'd run um, back and forth across a cove, and then you'd run the check lines to get that confirmation on it. So very systematic kind of mundane work, but still much the way it is done with multi-beams. So here we are today and the changes of uh, uh, how our work is done uh, nowadays. So here's our vessels for 2020 and you've probably seen the Otter Bay around in your travels and our smaller Shoal Seeker and our newest vessel, the uh, Kalman's Otter, uh, named after one of our former hydrographers and uh, the equipment that they have on it. So generally we're high res to about 500 meters and then it's uh, for deeper surveys, we have our vector. Again, a vessel built in Victoria, BC, still on the water. So many of you would have seen the vector around in surveys. I like the photo of it uh, originally, I think believe the photo in the top uh, left was around 1969 in Victoria. And you can see the William J. Stewart is just in front of uh, uh, the vector there at the bow. And this is, gives our deep water capability down to about 1800 meters. So here's a typical launch and the equipment on it. The big part now is using GPS for precise uh, positioning. Uh, we have an, an ADCP so we can get uh, uh, salinity, pressure, temperature, uh, water for corrections. Uh, Standard kind of fit is the R2 Sonic multi beam echo sounder. So, R2 Sonic's a company out of Texas. They make a great, versatile uh, multi beam echo sounder. And as well, uh, our laser scanner, which is kind of the newest technology that we have. So, here's kind of what the laser scanner looks like. So, if you see one of our vessels with this kind of TV box on it, it's actually scanning the coastline. So, instead of having to survey the coast uh, by triangulation and going, you can see that we can get a really, really detailed uh, view of the coast. So we can do very, very high resolution uh, products. And this is really revolutionizing our ability to put an accurate coastline and especially accurate information in areas that are in shoaling waters. A lot of times when uh, in shoaling areas, we'd simply say, well, we just put it green on the chart, it doesn't matter. But a lot of that um, area can have, you know, up to five meters at high tide but there can be hazards in there on the bottom. So we can get a much, much more accurate picture. And you can see even in this photo, you can see on the bottom, the tracks made by the keels of vessels that are going alongside. So this is the type of resolution uh, that we can get these days. And it's really revolutionized our work. A lot more data to deal with, however. We also now have an autonomous vessel. So very small, compact, runs on battery power. So very uh, friendly. There's the old versatile R2 Sonic on there, uh, has a very uh, accurate GPS uh, receiver, the Pause MV, and automatically does the sound speed profile to do a correction on it. We can run this via from a television camera ashore, 
or we can uh, pre-program it and uh, do all the collision avoidance from shore on it so it doesn't uh, uh, get, uh, get away from the obligation of the rules of the road, things like that. And using it, of course, there would be a, a, a radio navigation warning out and we can trailer this thing anywhere. So we're really gonna start looking into this technology and uh, the ability to use autonomous vessels. And there's of course our multi-beam echo sounder and the typical um, coverage that we're gonna get. Essentially, you're getting that full map of the bottom as if there was no water there. This is our coverage and this is an interesting uh, uh, graphic when you see how much high resolution multi-beam we, ha we have. So you can see out on the shelf here where there is some work with respect to uh, uh, economic zones and some initial exploratory work, uh, oil exploration work, uh, which was long ago shelved. But you can see we still have some gaps that we need to fill in. If you look at Haida Gwaii, especially on the East Coast, we did airborne lighter in that whole area the past couple of years. So we're gonna be coming out with a complete new scheme for Haida Gwaii, high resolution, modern uh, charts, modern ENCs that are gridded for ease of uh, use and management of data. So Haida Gwaii will really be a, a destination that's gonna have safe and modern products. So if you're ever, you know, in the future thought about going there, but said, you know, the, the information is not great, well, we're gonna have the products out there uh, that's really going to open that area up in terms of recreational boating and give you the confidence that you can get in there with your vessels into some of these great hidden uh, har harbors and coves that are up there and really do some great exploring uh, in that area. So here's a really shows you what new multi-beam data does. So we're looking at the, the charts, probably the raster in the back. You're probably looking about a 1960s, 70s survey data. And it's not that the, the data itself is, 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 is an error. It's simply not referenced to the new modern WGS84 um, datum. So you can see that the multi-beam data does somewhat conform to the same shape if you pulled it a little uh, to the uh, uh, southeast. And this is the level of updates that we're getting with new products. So you can really see how multi-beam really changes what a, the data in a chart is going to be when we get the new products out. And here's a comparison looking at uh, an older chart, which was 3724 that was withdrawn and then replaced by the new chart 3975. And you can appreciate the, the greater resolution of detail. You know, we had a lot of rocks on the 1979 chart, but literally with multi-beam, we really need to put the ones on the outer edges of a rock garden because we have so much information there. And of course, the discovery with the high resolution multi-beam, we find, you know, even in an overturned uh, rowboat can do a really, really high resolution picture. So we're finding a lot of abandoned vessels, a lot of ghost gear that uh, impacts fisheries and a lot of, you know, especially at the mouth of a river that impacts recreational fishing. So we can get a lot of that gear that's on the bottom and forgotten and get it out of there. So it supports uh, um, the fishing industry. And of course, sometimes we find a vessel that uh, was absolutely lost and you can actually start putting it together and, and get a profile of it based on the multi-beam. And even with known wrecks, this is a graphic, we actually did a study of where the Queen of the North sank, uh, heading up, as Mark said, up to Granville Channel. And, uh, uh, you know, this wreck was just, cut, the vessel was just coming into Granville Channel when it sank. So we do a good profile on it. It sits, literally sits right on its keel on the bottom, which is quite amazing how it sank and actually settled right on the bottom as if it was ready to go uh, at, a, at a moment's notice. So uh, obviously the wreck is still there, but it's neat to kind of go over it and get the condition of the wreck and pass that on to the Coast Guard and Transport Canada. We also do seabed classification. So there's the old bottom grab sampling. We use a little different kind of settings on our multi-beam echo sounder to get that information. But of course we wanna know where the, the, get that information out so we can say where the best anchorage positions are. We're not so good in our sailing directions, but you know, Mark's uh, work and uh, everyone's work on wagoners, they'll take this information and they'll let you know where the, where the mud is so you can anchor with confidence uh, with your vessel as you travel along the coast. 
And we are working to produce, you know, uh, higher resolution maps of that data to give that good detailed information on it and start filling in a little bit more what the what the bottom composition is. We also do, of course, the uh, tide stations, and uh, we have quite a network there. And know your water level. It's not just when the tide, you know, when the tide is uh, is high. Sometimes you want the low tide. So this is. Uh, just up, I think everybody probably has been to Bedwell Harbor to check into customs. And this is the canal uh, separating North and South Pender Island. And they just waited a little while more. They might have made it. So I didn't know you were a sailor, Mark. Oh, uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be me. Yeah, Mark <laughs> Bunzel. I'll look at you, Mark Bunzel. What are you, you doing know, there? I know that bridge and it's 26 feet. Yeah, and it, it certainly is. And, you know, there is a tide range there. So, you know, if you do have your sailing vessel and you're going to motor through, just make sure you got it because there's nothing worse than losing your mast. That's one to remember. Yes. And so our network, we kind of have 13 permanent gauges and we have four dedicated to tsunami monitoring. So those gauges, in fact, all our gauges do have a link right to Palmer, Alaska for the Northwest uh, Tsunami Warning Station. So we work very closely with NOAA on tsunami warnings as well and share our data. We also have 44 temporary gauges out. And the idea there is we're trying to do a model of a, a continuous vertical datum of the coast. So when we're surveying, we don't have to set up temporary gauges. We can predict what the water level is at any time. And some of that information is getting pushed out on AIS. So you'll see a little symbol there. If you query it, you'll get the, uh, the real-time water level information from that AIS station. So that's an issue if we have going with the Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard, and we're kind of refining that to make sure it's, it's readily apparent, easy to use. There is some problem with the messaging. Some AIS uh, equipment can, can read the message, others can't but we're working on developed uh, to make sure that there's a, a standard there that everybody can see that information. And as well, as I said, with, the, uh, with tsunamis and earthquakes. So this was uh, the 2012 quake in Haida Gwaii. And you can see there when, when there is a tsunami, it's a very, very distinct change in the water level information. Obviously Heslon Cove, which is a little island on a little island to the north of Haida Gwaii had the most significant change. And you can see here, there's about 20 centimeters. So, you know, you get a two meter wave all of a sudden. That's, that's, a, that's especially coming into a, a, a cove that, that funnels the water in, you can easily have a five, six meter wave out of nowhere. So we're working on the warning system for that. That's obviously something if you're at anchor at night, you'd wanna know about and you wanna get a warning that to come in. So. We're working and developing our uh, warning system and kind of leverage technology so that uh, you can automatically get a warning if you're on the water and there's a prediction of a tsunami along the coast. Here's some new water level monitoring. Again, everybody's probably familiar with Boundary Bay in the area. And this is using airborne uh, laser uh, LIDAR that is able to penetrate the water and what we're really happy to see here was that there was a good agreement with the, the current chart and the information, including where the channels were for the, uh, the rivers, Serpentine and uh, the Nicolnell River coming into the area where Crescent Beach is. So this is where we can use this laser technology to make sure our, our products are, uh, are correct. And of course, with, with Foundry Bay and just around the corner is Point Roberts, which is another great marina. And of course, all this data is to go in for our, our, our vertical datum and chart datum. Keep in mind, of course, Canada is higher high water large tide and lower low water large tide. It gives us a little bit more precision over uh, uh, the NOAA using uh, uh, largest normal tide and lower normal tides. Just a little bit more precision on our, on our uh, predictions with that. So. Uh, we continue to do that and of course all the different datums based on that with respect to clearances. So the big change now is the S100 world. You've probably heard a lot about these products and it's, it's simply S100 is the change in international standards from the International Hydrographic Organization. So they basically put an S is for standard and then they number everything and you know the old kind of charting specs were S4 here, S100, Current ENCs, of course, are S57. The new ANCs will be S101. 
So here's some of the, the different specifications of the of interest to, uh, to the mariners and boaters. The electronic navigation chart standard, the bathymetric surface, what'll give you that detailed bathymetry, which is even great to figure out where to go fishing with that layer. Uh, S104 will be the tide uh, information for surface navigation. S111 is gonna be the surface currents and S112 is a dynamic water level data that kind of puts everything together. So with S104, you'll kind of get this information uh, where you'll get that precise water level. So for any of our tide gauges now, you simply go to uh, the CHS site and you're gonna get the predicted and the actual and then the residuals. And the residuals are kind of showing uh, how far we're, we're off with respect to that, uh, um, that prediction. And that's really good for when you have a storm surge. So when you get that extra water, the residuals are really gonna show you that there's, uh, there's something abnormal happening there. And you can even see in the, in the data here with the uh, recorder where the high tide is higher than normal and there's probably a storm surge going on. So this information is really good to get that extra information and why real time is so important because with predictions, you're not gonna get that account for storm surge or any other dynamics that are going on in your area. So this is a lot what the real time uh, meteorological and water level information looks like on an AIS. So I believe this would be sand heads and you'll simply get a graphical display that'll simply give you what information is coming from the weather boy and then you'll get the water level. You can see it on the bottom there. I believe it's 2.1 meters. So that's how the real time information will look on your AIS. You simply have to query the symbol uh, that comes up and you can see uh, to the right where there is this information, you'll see that little key. And if you query that uh, position of that weather boy, you can see the, the wind barbs coming off it. You're able to get that information uh, directly onto your AIS system. So these are some of the things that are coming out that are currently in test that should be readily available in the next few years. I mentioned that we're looking for a phone app. So this is in development as well. And you should see advertisements for that to come up that you simply voted onto your uh, cell phone, your smartphone, and you'll be able to query any uh, Thai data station that we have along the coast. Fresh 111 is of course that, uh, uh, that horizontal flow of water due to the tides. And as you all know, there's some really significant places along the coast where you can get, you know, believe it or not, that photo is actually just current and with the changing tide. And what that's gonna look like for you here. So this is a uh, second arrows in Vancouver Harbor. This is the type of product that you'll get. So on your chart plotter, with uh, the S111 data, you'll get these vectors and the larger the vector, the greater the current. So you can see the application here for sailing and uh, other uses for that real time information. And especially, you know, if you just wanna save some fuel and relax and drift, you can see where the currents are and also what areas should be avoided uh, depending on, on your vessel. So this is gonna be a really good product when it comes out and it's well into the testing phase. Another thing that we're developing and realizing is crowdsource bathymetry. So you can see here in Clayton Passage, we had a 12.8 meter depth and it was through measurements of a, a recreational boulder that we actually did the chart change to nine meters based on that information that we received. So again, here's another situation uh, just up getting towards the entrance into desolation sound. We chart 3535, a mariner noticed that there was a little bit of shoaling and unshoaling here. And when we went back and looked at detailed information, sure enough, and we made a chart change on that. So you can see now that the rock symbol is in place there. And that's all from recreational boulder information. So there's a clear realization with us and NOAA that the information from the recreational boulder is actually key information to, to update products. And we're starting to incorporate that uh, into products and services now. So we are gonna again have a phone app for MarRep reporting, make it easy, that you'll simply fill out a form on your phone and send it in and pretty much almost instantly that'll result into a radio navigation warning for it and a nice easy graphical display. So instead of having to report it directly to MCTS, trying to give it all through voice or 
filling a, a paper in and, and faxing it off, our old technology, you're able to get this information in instantly. So that's a great safety feature and it's going to be improvement for everybody on the water. And of course, our sailing directions now are, uh, again, they're free for, for download in PDF version. The print versions are very limited uh, in, uh, uh, in distribution now and will soon be going away. So much like uh, Noah is doing, we'll be going to a, a PDF only for our tide books and PDF only for our sailing directions. The good news, I can say that the 2021 tide books for Canada are already on our site and available. So if you're doing any planning, they're there and ready for you. Uh, we are looking at options with third party vendors with respect to printing of publications for those who want to have a hard copy. And with her sailing directions, when you go online, it's fairly easy. Just look at the date that they're corrected up to, and then you'll see uh, how current your, your information is. So there's no need to check notice to mariners. The future of sailing direction is they're going to be split into layered information and geared more towards strictly the navigation piece. The key information that, that traditionally CHS did, and we started to move away from on marinas, services, uh, attractions in areas, you still wanna rely on, on the Wagoneers guide in this area for that information, because you'll see that, you know, in terms of these newer, newer regulations are really geared towards the commercial uh, aspect of it, not necessarily the traditional information that we were able to do. So it's very important that we maintain those relationships with, uh, with the third party, uh, uh, providers of navigation information. And you'll probably see that glow, grow and eventually working towards of CHS getting some endorsements of these products to say that, you know, this information is important and uh, it should be relied upon in those instances because we don't provide it. And of course, now the, the main product we have is the electronic navigation chart. So I like to say, you know, look at this and see what production was in the past. So here's the um, offices down on Government Street. So this would be that building when you're in Victoria walking down Government Street, the kind of uh, grayish granite building uh, just up from a couple of the pubs and, and restaurants. And, you know, the, top, the photo in the top left would be the chart correction team. And the other photo, uh, the gent is actually working on a new addition through the mylar layers and things. So this is how production used to be. And it was probably up like this right up until about 1985. Now, of course, the production is much faster. We have a database of information and now we even do very large scale, uh, what we call birthing scale products. So you can see one of the graphics is Canada Place and the birthing envelopes for the cruise ships that go there and then up in Crofton. And you can see very high resolution products. We can even show the bollards on there, the minimal depth and the box that the deep seas need to get in. The nice thing is that if you buy Canadian ENCs, you automatically get these products. So it helps you to understand uh, when you come alongside a jetty where you're gonna expect a deep sea if it's not there already and uh, give you those very high resolution products when you're going into certain harbors. And these are some of the products that uh, when, when Mark, uh, uh, Lorena and Leonard uh, visited us that we looked at and what we have in our archives. So here's uh, the chart of Vancouver Harbor in 1891. And you can see a lot of information. You get a large and small scale in one product. So good, good bang for the buck back then for Broad Inlet and the Harbor. And then you see the changes in 1971. Still, you know, you can basically see the age of the product now for sure compared to uh, 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 the modern versions and kind of the scale that was a little better. This shown second narrows and you needed those multiple kind of charts just to completely get into the, pro into the harbor and up Indian Arm. And then in 1991, you can see more improvements coming in and the chart we released last year and the level of detail and, and how color and improvements have been made. But of course things are evolving. So the modern chart is really just a representation of the data in our database. So you got greater detail, the new traffic schemes, the coastline is improved because of later laser scanning. And of course the modern hydrography. And of course, the electronic version, you're going to get that much uh, information and more. 
One of the efforts that Canada has made now is to make sure that we get more textual information on our EMCs. So you're going to see that the Spanish bank is labeled. A lot of the key points are labeled. And we're also bringing in uh, um, contour elevations for land. A lot of mariners have asked for that. And uh, we're going to be start bringing that information into our products. So uh, it's really exciting to see EMCs evolve into a more user-friendly product. And you can see here, it's starting to look more like a, a traditional product, yet you get the advantage of the anti-grounding capability. One of the great things with ENCs and the advantage over rasters, of course, is the ability to quickly get out notice to mariners. So Peter mentioned, you know, in terms of recreational boaters and areas with respect to whales. So in Canada, they've established uh, environmentally sensitive areas for whale foraging. So this is an area just off of Saturna Island. And the great thing is that with an ENC, you can query the area. You can clearly see where this area is. These areas were in effect from June till October 31st. So it's also important to know when these areas are canceled and you know that that area is available for boating again. So we can get those updates out very, very quickly within, a, you know, with weekly updates. So Using ENCs, you get that better access to these key information because it's very easy to see where the, the area is here and the area that you want to avoid while it is in effect. But it also gives us a better uh, method to let um, the mariners know and voters know when the area has been canceled. So that's a key part of getting that new information that we all need to be aware of uh, along the coast these days with restricted areas and and looking at those environmental impacts it has uh, on uh, operations on the water. And one of the things here is the transformation of so charts from ENC. So what we're looking at is, is we'll get away from the traditional kind of raster and paper charts, but a lot like NOAA is, we can generate the chart from the ENC and we can generate these products very quickly. And there can be some customization as to what the user wants. So. A lot of times you may want a general chart of portions of the coast, or you may want a detailed uh, harbor chart in areas such as Vancouver. So this technology is basically a one button press that takes you from the ENC to the paper chart. And we're working very closely with NOAA on that initiative. Uh, and they'll be able to provide the products. The nice thing is if we do this product output as a geo tiff, you'll still be able to use it as a raster on some chart system. So, while the traditional BSB raster may go away, there's an opportunity to provide a raster product as a GeoTIFF that'll work just fine on your systems as well. And here's what that S102 product would look like. You can see the, uh, the overlay of the, the, it's interesting, although it's the bottom, we call it a bathymetric surface because of the surface of the bottom of the ocean. And you can see how the grid will be used to manage that data. For the boater, however, though, the key is to get that information in and you can set go and no go areas. So with a, an S102 uh, data set coming into your system, the green is where it's safe to go. The red wouldn't be appropriate based on your keel depth. So it's a great product and a great opportunity to improve navigation instead of, you know, more or less having a track and having to stick to that track. This gives you the ability to see where all your, your safe water is and where you can maneuver. Hey, Mark, I want to insert myself here. We've got a couple sure. of questions and I uh, wonder if you want to tackle those. I'm not sure how much more material you have, but um, maybe we've answered some of those. But will some of these new vessels be updating charts in Northern British Columbia? Absolutely. So, okay, great. Uh -huh. And I'll give you the area. So we're going, we just did a, a new addition for Stewart, which is right on the Alaska border. And we have a couple of new additions for the Prince Rupert area coming out. So excellent. And that then, area, and of course, complete new. It'll be about thirty-five new e new ENCs for Haida Gwaii. So great. Thank you, Mark. And I'll read this to you. How are CHS, CHS and NOAA according secondary BC current station information? Generally, information from the two parties is very different and consistent. Uh, though reference station current data appears to always be the same. A related question is the BC secondary current station is provided by NOAA is very helpful, useful. Is there any plan for CHS to provide what they believe is accurate info? Um, and then, uh, so that was a bunch there. Did you track that? Yeah, I, I, I got the, I got okay. the gist of that. It's like yep. I mentioned to, 
to Mark uh, be, before this evening's uh, event started. When we went, when CHS went through budget cuts in the in the 90s and 2000s, one of the things that was kind of dropped was our collection of current data. So we went kind of on legacy data and predictions in areas such as Grenville Channel, where we say, okay, well, it's basically three knots on the flood or the ab, more or less. We quickly realized that there can be variations in that. So we do have a program now where we're actually putting ADCPs, we're putting current meters back in the water. And that's gonna improve uh, our predictions in some areas, but also through that S111 product, give you access to real-time current data in those areas. So that was something where we gathered that business and now we're getting back into it. And uh, we have, uh, I sent actually a crew went out today and they're trailing the equipment up to Prince Rupert for current meter we're putting into Porpoise Harbor up there. So you're gonna see improvements in that. Uh, the traditional, you know, our tide and current publications only give kind of those, those standard uh, primary and secondary locations. But here we can really take input from mariners where they want to see current information and actually deploy meters into that area. So that's a big question we get. A lot of uh, First Nations along the coast are interested in partnering with us to help uh, set up those stations and get the get the get the uh, equipment in the water. So yeah, we're definitely going to see more improvements in those predictions and hopefully go to real time through the S one eleven product. Perfect. Thank you there. Any questions as we wind down here? Uh, Landon's or Mark Ponzel? Well, there was a, a, uh, on the chat there, there was a question that, uh, that I also have. It has to do, uh, Mark, with uh, third party uh, providers of uh, chart data and where, where they get the data from. And if it's not consistent with the uh, CHS information, uh, what kind of controls are in there between the third party uh, chart vendors and the information that you folks have? Yeah, sure. So most third parties, for example, Wagoner's Guide, they have a, 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 an agreement, a licensing agreement with CHS. So they're able to use data that we have available in there. It's one of the things I talked about where traditionally CHS doesn't endorse third parties that we have a license with. And I see that as a shortfall because if our symbol was on there and say this product contains information from from uh, obtained from the Canadian Hydrographic Service and other sources, I'm sure it would give that, uh, you know, assurance that that information is accurate. A lot of it, uh, you know, for some of the third party products, however, it's 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 up to the the company themselves to have the integrity in that information. So one of the, the things we're discussing as we look at our business transformation is that, you know, it would be a benefit to the mariner if they know that there is a third party agreement with CHS and that some of the data coming out of there is used there. And, you know, I look at some information such as, you know, de details on ma marinas and attractions and facilities. I don't have the staff to keep up with that. So, you know, we rely on products such as Wagoner's Guide just as much for that other detailed information. And I think CHS can be better in terms of how we let uh, the marine community know what products has information from us in it. And, you know, a lot of it does come down to reputation of what products are better than others. You know, generally for the for the the products provided by, you know, Garmin, Fugawi and things like that, they get a data update from us at least once a year, but there's no really regulation on how uh, frequent their updates may be. It may be monthly, it may be six months, it may be one year only. Uh, that's why the key, you know, to watch radio navigation warnings uh, as you go into an area and check the notice to mariners. And that's what's a great part of uh, this form is to see that little review at the start and that, that you know, folks are monitoring that. So that's some of those issues that I think as, as CHS more defines what data we're going to provide, what data we're going to uh, allow the third party and uh, you know, the, the commercial side to provide and kind of get that kind of agreement together of the mutual sharing and mutual monitoring of that information. Uh, okay. yeah. Thanks. And, uh, the, uh, the future of uh, raster charts for, uh, for Canadian hydrographics? Yeah, what you'll probably see is that we'll stop producing what we call the BSB raster, the rasters that are available. So like the, the typical 
chart that you see at the bottom of the slide here. But if we say the output of, of our paper chart next generation from the ENC is a GeoTIFF, that'll work fine as a raster in any of the systems. So while we may get out of producing a dedicated raster, it doesn't mean we can't provide a product. And this is something I bring up a lot with NOAA is, is say, okay, we can get out of that business and make the ENC the primary. But if we make our print file a GeoTIFF, uh, uh, rather than a, a, another type of file, right now in Canada, they're just PDFs. And even if it's a Geo PDF, a GeoTIFF will work fine in your, your system as a readable raster product. And the GeoTIFF does have that, that coordinate information that you would need to show your position. So my point is we don't have to get out of the business. We can still provide a print file but it may not have all those current specifications with respect to the IHO uh, uh, S61 raster format. And I think the IHO will get away from having a typical format for rasters and kind of leave it up to countries, you know, if they want to have that product. So right now I don't have a, what you'll probably see for Canadian, EN, for Canadian rasters is that you'll see areas where there is an ENC that those will be the first rasters that are withdrawn. And with that, you'll see a significant reduction in the price of ENCs in that area so that there's a product that can be purchased and used in the electronic chart systems. So no schedule on that yet, but you'll probably see within the next year, you'll see some announcements. And that's where kind of user focus groups will really come in handy to kind of look at different options there and what the actual need is in terms of the marine community. Marco Block, I have no idea what you just said those last three minutes. I don't no, think I understood a word. I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm just thrilled that we have a resource like the Canadian Hydrographic Service available to us and the resources they put into that, but also the dedication. The people that are doing it, uh, uh, they, they love their jobs, they love what they're doing. And uh, just as this slide says that Mark put up, you know, protect lives, property, and the marine environment. And boy, that, that says it all right there. And uh, uh, we're, we're glad. And, and Mark, we really want to thank you for taking the time. This is valuable information for people to know and, and to understand where this great data actually comes from. So from all of us, thank you. And I've already volunteered us for focus groups. And uh, we may put out the word to our audience, uh, for those who want to volunteer for focus groups, not yet, but when we do, we hope you'll participate. And uh, we've got partners at Canadian Hydrographic Service that'll really listen to our input. So Mark, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're, uh, uh, we're gonna wrap up here. Uh, yeah. We'll be back. Uh, it's gonna be Friday tomorrow, Mark. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> And which can mean that it's Friday the 13th as well. So be on guard. Thank you. I appreciate that. I won't be out voting tomorrow. So I, I'm at least in good shape there. Uh, we've got a, a good show lined up for next week. We've got uh, uh, John Neal and Amanda Swan Neal that are going to come on and talk about some of the cruising they've done all over the world, literally all over the world. Amanda has a new cookbook out. So she'll be talking about that. But uh, John and Amanda, anytime I sit down with them, uh, they're just uh, a fountain of information and, and a lot of fun, and we really appreciate it. And I need to mention again, thank you to our sponsor, the Grossbeck Realty Group and Anna Cortes. Uh, they uh, uh, help us uh, in terms of being able to fund putting this all together, and we appreciate that. And Leonard, Lorena, what did I miss? I got that. Did I miss anything else? Uh, the other one, or we're off for Thanksgiving, uh, U.S. Thanksgiving at least. Yeah, You're not going to be. Well, I was. I guess I'll do the show by myself. Yes. <laughs> yeah, from your <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. No, it's good yeah, stuff. so we're going to skip a week that week, but we'll be here next week, a week from tonight, with John and and Amanda, and then we've got a whole lineup of shows after that that are going to be terrific, leading right into the Seattle Boat Show. That's right. So uh, episode 26, that was Lily Tomlin and James Taylor. We're kicking off season two of Starting Live at this one same of my time. Favorites. There, what a night that would have been. <laughs> this was just as magical, Mark, and you know that. 
Yes, I uh, do. Well, at this point, we're going to say goodbye. And I guess I would say, tell a friend out there about our show. Uh, we'd love to build a crowd, uh, a nicer audience. Nothing to say that you're not all nice out there, but yeah, tell a friend or a family member about our show and help us build an even bigger crowd. So on that note, I'm going to say goodnight, everybody. I'm going to say goodnight, goodnight everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.